Hello and welcome everybody to the latest episode of Cook and Liberty, a show in which I get to cook while having a conversation with my friends from the Liberty Movement. Today with me I have, I have uh, Eli Lassman from the chair at Prometheus from campus and as always, thank you for, for joining me today, Eli. Thanks for inviting me, Simon. It's a pleasure. I hope the food will be as nice as the conversation will be. I, I hope so. I hope so. So the thing is, uh, for, for, for everybody that's returning, they know what, what's happening now, but like for those that don't know, uh, today I'm going to be cooking um, um, uh, pork, pork loin, which I'm of course going to stuff it in a very Macedonian salmon kind of way with a lot of bacon and a lot of cheese. Today with me I brought three, three, uh, three, uh, three types of cheeses. The idea is that you just need some, some melting, melting cheeses. Other than that, other than that, it's up to you. Today, uh, today I have um, um, with me cheddar, I have Eidemer and I have a Gouda. Uh, the point is, um, and this is a, a big shout out to my, to my uh, videographer uh, who, who said like, oh Simon, why don't you do the Simon all inclusive, which basically means in, in essence, so I have, I have three sirloins, so in essence means that instead of doing like three different types, I will, uh, uh, I will do one with one type of cheese, the second one will be with, with the second type of cheese, but the third one will be with all of them, so that's called the Simon all inclusive. And before I, I, I get to, to the stuffing part, uh, I, I would like to start the, the conversation here with Eli. And of course, um, this is some sort of um, a bit of a mystery to me because Eli is uh, an economist by, by trade, but at the same time, he's, he moved to the philosophy. So what brought you to the philosophy part of? Right. So that's a, an interesting question. And let me just start by clarifying that when you say I'm an economist by trade, I have a bachelor's degree in economics. And I don't, in fact, work in, in any economic field. But getting to your question about how I became interested in philosophy, let's go, let's go back to my, my childhood, my, my teens, where I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, and I've, I found that I have been interested in philosophy for a very long time. I simply didn't know it. So I remember when I would get together with my friends in my teens and we would have conversations that go long into the night and we would talk about philosophical concept, but we would just call these things deep conversations. And sometimes we'd even call them just good conversations. So we would have one, we would have a conversation that goes deep into the night and deals with philosophical concepts, but we wouldn't know it because every time we, or whenever we came across philosophy, it was always inaccessible, it was illegible. And well, I certainly felt so. I felt like it was something out of my reach. And w the reason why we called it good conversations is because we dealt with the things that really matter, the things that really, really matter. And I suppose you can say I was always interested in philosophy in this sense. I just simply didn't know that what I was, what, what I was talking about was quote unquote philosophy. And then I went to university and I went to study economics. And the reason why I went to study economics is because, well, I was interested in really broad abstractions, the depths of, of the deepest depths as, I, as the conversations I had with my friends, but I didn't realize that that was philosophy. And in fact, as surprising as this may be, I thought that was economics. I thought economics was the study of everything. And you know what, when I was in high school, I thought it was physics. And then I quickly realized it isn't physics then thought it was economics. So I go and do a degree in economics. And after a couple of years doing my degree in economics, I realize it is in fact philosophy. But you know what, let me tell you how, what, what happened during those two years. So a few weeks after starting university, I received some emails from, from the university itself and the student union that really confused me because they asked me to rank people based on race and based on sex and sexual orientation. And I remember sitting there as a first year, completely new to university in a new country, city that I'd never seen before, reading this email and rereading this email and trying to figure out what they mean by this. And I, and I remember being so perplexed. So I sent them an email about this and they got back to me and I, I thought they would correct this mistake, but they got back to me to assure me that the mistake was on my part and that racism is okay if it's against some races and it's bad if it's against others. And sexism is the same and, and the same goes for any form of discrimination or bias. 
And I just couldn't wrap my head around this. And I'd never thought about this too deeply. And I really tried to give them, not the benefit of the doubt, but I tried to understand where they're coming from. And there was not a second where I thought to myself, yeah, this kind of makes sense. It, just, it never did and it never will. And I was so frustrated. I, said, I remember sending this email to my friends and my family and asking them, look, is there something here that I'm missing? And there wasn't. So, go, so from, from there on, I decided I'm going, to, I'm going to go against the university. I'm going to make a video about this. I'm going to write to them. I'm going to make this public. And I'm, I'm going to stand up for this, against this. This is not right. And although I didn't know about philosophical concepts, I certainly had a feeling of what is right and what is wrong. And I knew that discrimination in any case, um, it, when it comes to inherent characteristics, is wrong. So I made this video, I, I emailed them, I made a public statement, and nothing really came of it. And similar things happened in my first few months at university. And what I've realized from that is that either I'm going to be a silent bystander and just let injustice take place, or I have to go against this actively and that's what I decided to do. So I, I, I was thinking, what is the best way to create change? What's the best way to change things? And what I, what I came to the conclusion was, well, as an economic student, because as an economic student, what you get taught is the policymaker is God. So <laughs> I thought, okay, fine, I'll become a policymaker. Let me go into politics. So I dabbled with politics, uh, specifically local politics, and my my vision was to to one day go into to national politics. Thank you very much. Not too much for me. See, of course, I, I me being the the foodie, of course, I went for making the food instead of <laughs> the pouring the wine. But still, and you also poured your glass first. I, I I saw that and I thought that you were not gonna mention. Believe me, I did see that, but I was like, oh. I'm gonna call you out. Yeah, sh shame on you, shame on you. Well, look, before I continue, shall we raise a glass? Of course. As you said earlier, to freedom. Freedom. But yes, do continue. That's good Macedonian wine. I did, I did tell him earlier yeah. and he was like, I tried everywhere, you know, in Georgia, in Armenia, here and there. And I have heard stories about the Georgian wine. Still have not had the chance to, to drink it. I've heard only stories, but... I, I still think from the few things that Macedonians can be proud of, wine is one of those. So this wine is good, but let me just make it clear. Oh. So my Turkish oh. and Armenian and Georgian friends don't think that I, that I uh, insult their wine, that it was fantastic wine. But this is also really good. So he, he wants to be a politician, in other words. <laughs> what he's saying is, I want to be a politician, guys. So, so this, this uh, tallies really well with what I'm saying, and that I realized, well, actually, it's the opposite of, of where I'm going because I've realized very quickly that I don't in fact want to be a politician because, for, well, for two main reasons. One, I couldn't find a party that I identify with. There were things that I liked about some of the parties and things that I didn't like about other parties, um, and uh, sorry, about the same parties, and these were fundamental differences. And what I, what I liked about some of the parties was the, the freedom that they were advocating for. So with the left wing, it was mostly social freedoms and yeah. with the right, it was mostly financial freedoms, at least in, in theory, it ought to be. And I decided to leave politics um, for, for that reason and also for the reason that I wanted to, I, I wanted to make real long-term sustainable change. And I understood that that doesn't come from politics. It, it, there's too many examples. We can see it all over that political change can be turned over like that. And the, the only way to create real long-term sustainable change is to change the culture. That's the only way. And one thing my mum always taught me, and my mum and I disagree on, on pretty much everything, <laughs> but she's an educator by trade, and she instilled the value of, of education in me. And I realized I want to be an educator and not a politician. So I'm, I'm back at university and I decide to found a student club based on the value that I find in across the political parties. And that's freedom. So I, I found a, a freedom society. And for about a year, I'm I, sorry. Yeah. I, I just don't understand this. Uh, found across the political parties. That's only a lip lip. Um, um, they just say freedom, but I would wholeheartedly disagree that we agree on what freedom is. But probably most of the political parties today. 
all over the world, not not where we come from, but like everywhere. I completely agree. And if, if we didn't disagree with the political parties, then maybe we'd have someone to vote for. But that's the very problem. Very I, I agree with you. I, I have not voted since uh, since when I was young and dumb at 18. So I, 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 I have that yeah. badge of honor. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, we, we, can, we can talk about that later. But anyway, so as I was saying, so I found this student society and it's all about freedom. And in fact, how I found that it is an interesting story, but it's a bit long winded. So for the, to save some time, I'll save that for another time. So for a year after founding the society and advocating for freedom, I read a lot of Austrian economics because I believe that the economic case for freedom is the case to, to make for freedom. I didn't know any other case really. And at the end of that year, I really by chance happened to be given the opportunity to attend a philosophy conference. And I remember at the time of, of having this opportunity, it was in the United States and I'd never been and I'd always wanted to go and I thought, wow, this is an amazing opportunity. So there was one voice in my head saying, well, you've, you've got to take this, this chance. Like, it's amazing. You're going to go to the States and you'll have a great time. And look, it's philosophy, but you, you might enjoy it. And the other side is telling me, look, it's a philosophy conference. You, you, you don't like this thing, like philosophy, who needs it? And basically, I just, and I, but I decided to go. And I remember the first talk was about free will. And I didn't realize, and I know this might sound like absurd, but I did not realize that free will was a philosophical issue. And I, I simply had no idea what philosophy was because every single time I tried to engage in it, I was put off either by the books or the, the lectures or the people that I was discussing it with. And for the first time, it was made accessible to me and not just accessible, for the first time, the conversations that I loved, the, the good conversations, as me and my friends would call them, were unified under this one discipline. And I remember leaving that conference knowing that this is what I want to do. This is what I want to study and this is what I want to teach. This is what I want to learn. And so after that conference, I, I went, went back to my university and completely changed my approach in how I make the case for freedom because I understood that there's a stronger case for freedom than the economic case. And that's the philosophic case or what is known as the moral case for freedom. And it's very straightforward. All it is, is that you, me, each individual can exist for their own sake. That's it. You can exist for your own sake and you don't have to exist for the sake of someone else. You don't have to serve others. You don't have to, you don't enslave others and you don't have to be a slave yourself. And that's so straightforward, but yet it was, it, it was in a sense lost on me and on so many others. And so, so to answer your question with a very long winded answer, but this is the point. I discovered philosophy after years of being interested in economics. And once I discovered it, I not only fell in love with it, but I understood the importance of it. And when I, when I said like philosophy, who needs this thing? Well, I need this thing and everyone needs this thing. So that's how I came across it. See, but today uh, people, especially younger generation, they don't care. Yeah, uh, this is gonna be a bit tricky now. See, uh, I, I, we, the conversation went in, in the sort of the right direction uh, where I kind of was hoping, was gonna ask, uh, you, you speak about, about uh, philosophy and who needs it and especially the young generation, they just do not care about philosophy at all. So how do we bring, I don't know, philosophy, if it matters as much as you say that it is, uh, that it does, how do we bring it to the, the younger generation? Do we bring it with like, Thought experiments from the, uh, uh, you know, the most famous trolley problem, and everybody knows the trolley problem at least in essence. So, would you would you say that's the way with thought experiments, or or maybe pop culture? I don't know, because again, you see the you see the philosophy uh, deba the, uh, debates happening in uh, all the shows from Rick and Morty, which is very famous, to everything. So, what would be your approach to bringing philosophy? Well, you mentioned Rick and Morty and, yeah. and some, some pop culture and philosophy is in everything. Like if you, if you really think about it, ideas move the world and every, every movie, every piece of art, everything you do is motivated by some ideas, some premises and 
in, in some senses directed towards some sort of values. So how do we get young people to understand the value of philosophy? I would say through education. I think that my charity, which we'll probably get to, yeah. is going to play a large role in that, especially in the United Kingdom. And yeah, art certainly plays a huge role in this. And unfortunately, if you look at modern art, you, you, you see a, a rejection of values and you, you can't really make sense of what you see. And the parallel of that is, well, you can't really make sense of the world. And I definitely think that art is a crucial, I guess, key element yeah. of introducing young people to philosophy. So is pop culture. I, I, I don't really engage in pop culture. I don't watch TV or hardly watch any movies. But, and, and that's mostly because when I do, I just find it too morally corrupt. But yeah, I certainly think that if, if uh, pop culture would focus on the right values and, and would promote the right ideas, then it, it would definitely influence people, or at least young people, because that's what they're engaged in. But I think that the right ideas are out there. And what we need to encourage students and, and, and young people generally is to seek, seek them out, like want to understand the world, want to live a good life and not be told that life is bad and life is suffering and that values are unattainable. And I think life is, is amazing, life is beautiful and you can have a great time. And it all, but fundamentally it all comes down to education and our education system today is doing a very poor job in, first of all, not, not only instilling the right values in, in uh, our youth, but also in teaching them to be independent and individualist and think for themselves. Uh, there's too, too much of a, a socialized approach to education. Uh, and, and it, but we can't really discuss this without talking about, I guess, the, the philosophical climate today. Like I said, I study economics, not philosophy, so I, I don't have first-hand experience of academic philosophy. But during those three years at university, I spoke with many philosophy students. One of my good friends is a philosophy student. And I spoke with philosophy professors as well. And philosophy courses, from, from my understanding, and not just my understanding, my experience, are not really geared towards the study of wisdom, the, the, the love of knowledge, but rather they, it's almost in, there's almost an intention and a goal of getting philosophy graduates to know less than they did coming in, or at least to doubt more than they did coming in, and to doubt that to, to, to doubt uh, their their eyes, to doubt their senses, to doubt their mind. And I think that academic philosophy has completely gone astray. I think if you're a philosophy graduate, you're probably at a huge disadvantage in understanding the world as opposed to anyone else. I'd also say that... This I did not expect, I'll, I'll have to say that I did not expect this to be... <laughs> I, unfortunately, that's, that's everything that I've heard, everything that I've seen. I hope that it, w I hope that it wasn't the case. I, I, I hope that it changes fairly soon, but unfortunately, it is, it is how it is. And, and, and uh, just to be fair to philosophy professors, at least at my university, to my understanding and from my experience, while that is their intention, they're still willing to have conversations about other philosophers and other schools of thought, and they try to do so fairly objectively. But that doesn't excuse the, the, the environment of yeah. academic philosophy. And then you have, of course, 5,000, 2,000, and 1,300 years of religion, and I'm, I'm talking about Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And in a, in, a, that's, in a sense, religion is a substitute to philosophy. It's, it's an entire worldview, which is what philosophy is in, in a sense. And what does it tell you? Well, very broadly, it tells you there is something above you. You are not the, the, the first thing that matters. You ought to live your life for something higher. And sure, you can be an individualist and, and some Christians and Jews and Muslims would say that. But at the end of the day, there is something, bef something comes before you. You are not first. Uh, you, do, you, you must not put yourself first. Otherwise, you're not a true Muslim, a true Jew or a true Christian and so forth with the other religions. And again, well, what does that teach you? It teaches you to sacrifice. It teaches you to 
to, to live for others. And that others doesn't have to be some sort of human entity. It can be some supernatural entity, but you're not living for yourself. Not in, not in the direct sense. And, yeah. and I guess also you have like professional intellectuals. Who... Uh, sorry, before we go to the professional intellectuals, uh, with the sacrifice and live for others, I, I got to ask, and I would presume some sacrifices you make for family or friends or whatever your, pardon, I don't know, significant other, uh, would those sacrifices be acceptable? And then again, would you even call them sacrifices or you just use a different term? I would use a different term and it, it, well, it depends what you mean. So for example, if I do something because my mum wants me to do it, well, and, and it's not convenient to me in, in, in a very minor sense, and I'd rather, I don't know, play the PlayStation or do something else. Well, I wouldn't call that a sacrifice because I value my mother and I want her to be happy. And I, I, would, I would do things for her that in some ways inconvenience me because she's a higher value to me than my PlayStation or the book that I'm reading or whatever it is that I'm doing. I wouldn't call that a sacrifice. What I would call a sacrifice is, is my, if my mother told me, Eli, I want you to leave philosophy and become a doctor. I don't want to be a doctor. Like doctors are awesome. I, I, I have some issues with the doctor profession, but like doctors generally are great. And, but it's not for me. It's not what I want to do. And I wouldn't sacrifice my, my passion because my mother wants me to be a doctor. So I just wouldn't call those things sacrifice if, if that makes sense. See, I, I did ask that in a sense, just because a regular person like uh, someone who does not think about philosophy, not, not, not me trying to say that people are stupid who don't think about this stuff. It's just, you know, they have more important things to do and other things to do, right? It's not all about what we are discussing here today. Uh, they sort of equalize those, uh, those terms. So that's, that's where my sort of question comes from. You know, what, what again, yeah. <laughs> now me becoming the philo philosopher here uh, asking for the definition so that's where I came yeah. from that's that's a that's a good point a lot of people equate doing something for another with sacrifice but that's not what it is and it doesn't make sense if you think about it like we're social beings and yeah. other people have values to us why would I not do something for another but I wouldn't do something that radically inconveniences me for a stranger because they're not a value to me. It depends. So it's all contextual, yeah. but doing something for another in, in, a, in an absolute sense is certainly not a sacrifice. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And I guess, okay, so going back to what I was saying, so you have academic philosophy, you have religion, and you also have professional intellectuals. I guess examples could be maybe like Jordan Peterson, yeah. Slavoj Žižek, uh, Ryan Holiday, and, and a few and some others. And I think that their influence is due to two things mainly. So, firstly, I would say some of their ideas make sense. Like some of the things they say. Uh, and and I, I, I clearly haven't given my position on these people, but let me just state it right away. I think they're a mixed bag of good and bad, a mixed bag of good and bad. And uh, so some of the things they say make sense. So let's take Peterson, for example. So he, he, he says, clean your room, stand up straight, get your house in order. Well, I mean, yeah, those things are kind of surface level, but let's just dig below and think about what he means by this. Well, he's saying that as a response to the modern left who goes out marching and demanding order in the world as they see it, but their thoughts are not in order. And, and the, the analogy is their house and their room and, and their, their posture, but in fact, there's chaos going on in here. So it makes sense that you want to organize your thoughts before you go out and tell people how to live their lives. So that part of him makes sense. And there's a lot of other things. And, and I think he's a fantastic psychologist and he's a great social analyst a psychiatrist, sorry, but there's also the other part, which is Jordan. Yeah, social, social analyst is a good term to... Let's use that. Social analyst, I think, <laughs> works well. I don't think he'd be upset by that. So, uh, and, but then you have Jordan Peterson, the philosopher, who talks about things like how pain is the, the most real thing and it's uh, an absolute and, and so forth. So the point is you have a mix of good and bad and the, the problem with that kind of relates to the second point that I was going to make about their popularity, which is 
I think in today's society, we're conditioned to take people's word as knowledge. And I, I'll give you an example of what I mean. So slogans and tropes like trust the government, Fauci knows what he's saying, just take him at his word, or the WHO uh, have done all this research, you don't need to look into it. We're being conditioned to just trust experts and we don't need to ask why or what is going on here, what is the broader picture. So Jordan says, clean up your room. And you're like, yeah, this makes sense. And then pain is the, the absolute reality. And you're like, okay, well, I don't quite get that, but I'm gonna accept it because he's an expert. So coming back to like the original question of like, what is the, what's like the philosophical climate today? I, it's not great from, from, what I, <laughs> from what I gather. Not great. <laughs> but it's, it, I think it's better than it has been in some points in history. And I think it's, it's much more promising than, than well, it's, it's more promising than I've ever seen it because I haven't really engaged in it. But I meet so many amazing people who promote incredible ideas. And I, we, I am certain that we're going to build a better future. I know that we're going to see a, a freer future and a freer world. And that's where, that's where my charity comes in as well. But yeah, you... that's what I was gonna ask uh, next. Ba basically, what what uh, what is Prometheus on campus and what does it do? But like before that, I kind of when you mentioned Zizek, so of course we don't agree with Zizek on pretty much nine out of ten times uh, things. I would presume both me and you. Right. But the thing is, I remember one thing that uh, that he said is uh, something along the lines of. I remember when you were a child and you were told that you should go to your grandma. So that's one one way of 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 you know telling uh, your your child what he should do. But like the second part of you should actually love going to your grandma, even if you hate it for whatever reason, you know whether uh, justified or not. Then we we come into a big problem, you know, societal. All of a sudden, we should do something that we don't want to, don't think that we should want to, but all of a sudden we are kind of taught and forced to. And yes, imagine the, 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 this comes from your family and continue, uh, make the larger picture. And I don't think that Zizek in that video was trying to make, make the big picture, but like think about on a societal level, uh, as you mentioned Fauci and COVID, all of a sudden we were being told that we should uh, you know, care about other people. And it's not that we don't care about people, like, but the way it was phrased, it was, I, similar to yeah. coming back to what you said earlier, you should live for other, other values, not other people, but let's say other values, something that you don't agree at all. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with you, and, I, and I, I, it seems like I would agree with him on this, but that would be an exception. And okay, so you mentioned thought experiments. Well, I think thought experiments, I'm just going to focus on this because I think it's, it's interesting. I think they're a good way to to study philosophy in if you, if you do if you use them correctly so i think you've got to ask yourself well what is the purpose of this particular thought experiment and does something depend on it because in philosophy classes from what i've heard there are so many thought experiments that are put forth by professors that have no basis in reality and nothing really depends on the answer it just makes no difference so like the trolley problem which you mentioned yeah the most famous one, if you ask me. Yeah, it, it is. And although I did Google and it was number 10, but uh, if you ask me from all the people that I know, <laughs> if I ask them about, uh, about uh, a thought experiment, they will say, trolley problem, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would think so too. Do you want to explain to the viewers what it is? I will, I will, I will let this to okay, the philosopher. So, so. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. Essentially, <laughs> you, find your, you magically find yourself, you've appeared, Magically. In a, in a trolley, <laughs> basically like a train, a cart. And you're on track and you see in the future, there's, uh, you see in the distance, sorry, there's five people tied to the track. And you have an option to pull a lever which diverts the train to another track and there's only one person tied to that track. So what do you do? That's essentially the trolley problem. Well, that's the first part of it, but the second part is insignificant. So let's just focus on the first part. And the question is, well, what do you do? Well, I, I, the, the fundamental problem with the trolley thought experiment is that it takes away the thing that underlies the purpose of the thought experiment, 
which is morality. So if you think about it, morality is all about choice. In, in, a, in a future that's uncertain, you're faced with an infinite amount of choices and there's always an alternative. There's always a choice, there's, there's a, a, a ranking to each choice and, and how beneficial it is for your own life. But when you take away the choices and your two alternatives are death or death, morality just goes out the window. Morality does not pertain. Any choice you make here is neither right nor wrong. So the, the biggest problem with, with the thought experiment is that it simply takes away the thing on which it stands. Let's just overlook that, right? So you have another problem. Well, why are there people tied to a track? Like if, if, if this comes back to does this thing have anything to do with reality? So okay, you find yourself here, but like what the real question I would ask, the first question that would come to mind is why are people tied to a track? Who's going around tying people to a track? And what's going on here? And so you've got to take the context into account. You've got to ask yourself, well, who are these people? Are we talking about five strangers on one track and then my child on another? Are we talking about five innocent people on one track and a criminal on another? Like there's, too, there's a lot of context to take into account. So many variables that you just throw away and just ask, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, me coming with the economics, like a two variable, you know, yeah. equation, you want to solve it. Like it's, it's quote unquote easy on whatever stand you make, uh, you just pull a lever and that's it. Because in this scenario, you don't um, have any consequences, right? But like, but when I th see, <laughs> I prepared for, for what we are doing today, but at the same time, I, uh, I thought of this right now while we had the conversation and this uh, connects me to the World War II and with the Enigma machine. And this comes from the movie, of course. Uh, I, I have not read this story beforehand, but it's, it's like they had cracked the code. Uh, one of the people that is in charge of sort of cracking the messages uh, sees that the Wolfpack, the, the German U-boats are gonna attack that convoy, which uh, my brother is on one of those ships. And I want to tell the ship, uh, no matter what, to, to, to reroute the convoy, right? But the thing is, if I do that, all of a sudden, uh, they will know that we have cracked their code. And I think that this is the trolley problem, basically, in reality, that has happened if the, if the, if the movie is correct on that point. Yeah. And this is a totally different, because you have skin in the game, right? And I would, as you said, with the child, if my child was there, pff, I would move heaven and earth to save my child, right? Yeah. I don't care about, I don't know, the Pope, the, the president, uh, or whatever, the random million people in, in, in front of it. Uh, at least I... I completely agree with you, yeah. I, I, I think that's the point. You have to take all the context into account. And it's not like there aren't parallels where you see something similar to the trolley problem, but of course there's more variables in real life. I think, so another two issues with the trolley problem, and this is where it relates to the last point that I was making is, well, what it wants you to do is it wants you to assume two things. One, that life has inherent value, and two, that the premise of the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's by taking everything out of context, but like an example of, of a maybe modern parallel, which, again, has way more variables, and this is a very rough parallel, but we're kind of forced into a trolley problem once every four years when we're asked <laughs> to vote. I mean, you're forced with a dilemma where you either vote for a, for a blue train and sacrifice X number of people for the benefit of Y number of people, or you vote for the red train and sacrifice Y number of people for the benefit of X number of people. Either way, you're doomed and or damned and even if you don't one of those trains is going to sacrifice some number of people so although the trolley problem doesn't ever really exist out of context it it can have some use in, in if you if you take the broader context into account and but going back to the the, the politics analogy well again there are more alternatives there's the third alternative alternative which is what i would like to offer let's have no people on the track. Let's not tie people to the track. Like, let's tell these red people and the blue people and whatever color they are in, in every country, stop tying people to the track. 
and I think the ride will be smoother. See, I agree. Let's just try to solve the trolley problem when we have the trolley problem, when, when you have the Enigma machine and it's a war. Cheers to that. But other than that, let's just not try to solve a problem that we could avoid. But yeah, I don't know. People are weird, so are we. <laughs> it's a world we're living. I don't know. But like, with this, I kind of want to um, ask you about uh, what you're doing with your project with the Prometheus sure. on campus, uh, because it is connected to philosophy, right? So can you tell us more about that? Yeah, of course, it definitely is connected to philosophy. In fact, the purpose of the charity is to promote philosophy, rational philosophy, philosophy for, for living a good life, philosophy for freedom, philosophy for independence on campuses in the United Kingdom. And one of the reasons why I founded it is one, because I saw the value of my student club on my campus and the impact that it had. And secondly, because out of 160 or over 160 higher education institutions in the United Kingdom, there are only around six freedom oriented clubs. So we are going to change that. And I guess it wouldn't be right of me to talk about the purpose of the charity and not mention Prometheus. So Prometheus, it was in Greek mythology, was a titan. And titans can be thought of similar to gods or the Greek gods, they're just like different generations. And Prometheus was the titan who stole the fire from the gods. So fire was, was seen as one of the elements that belonged purely to the gods, to Olympus, to the heavens, and it was not accessible to mankind. And Prometheus, who was a lover of mankind, decided that he's going to steal the fire and bring it down to humanity. And, oh, you know, I mentioned he's a lover of mankind. So Prometheus, there's been many, many different uh, cit citations of, of him in, in literature the past 2000 years. I'm just going to mention that as I walked in here, I noticed that painting of, of Moby Dick. And of course, in, in Moby Dick, there's a, a mention of Prometheus, just quite a funny coincidence. And you see him in Dostoevsky and, and uh, Mary Shelley and several others. Uh, and in, I mentioned he's a lover of mankind. Well, in Goethe's poem, Prometheus, he actually takes it a step further and he says that not only he's a lover of mankind, he's a hater of the gods. I think this is called yeah. misotheism. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a, a line in the poem which goes something along the lines of, Prometheus is talking to the gods here and he says, you would even starve if children and fools would not trust in you. Something along, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something along those lines. So he clearly has some sort of disdain for the gods, in, at least in this poem. So anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. So Prometheus, the titan that stole the fire from the gods, gave it back to mankind. Well, he gifts it to mankind, and what happens? Zeus is enraged, and he sentences him to damnation, uh, eternal damnation. He chains him to a mountain and has... A, a bird, I think it's a crow, fly every single day and peck on his liver. Now, titans are immortal, so this is an eternal punishment, and his liver regenerates every single day, so it, it's like eternal suffering. Prometheus also means foresight, and this is a point that I, I find interesting, and a lot of people speculate that Prometheus could see the future, and that's why he was called foresight. And he knew that by gifting the fire to the gods, to, to mankind, excuse me, he would be punished in such a way and be damned to eternal suffering. But he still decided to do so. Because of the red thing. <laughs> yes, the, the, but I've got to emphasize here because the first time I thought about it, I was like, what? So you've got to sacrifice for mankind? You've got to sacrifice for others? Like, that's the noble thing? And that's not what I take away from this. And I don't think that's the right interpretation of the story. It isn't about sacrifice. It is about doing what is right, standing up for your principles. And I think it, it's also supported by the fact that eventually he was freed by Hercules. And if he really had foresight, then he knew this. And I mean, if he's immortal, then what is like a few years? It goes by <laughs> like that, like, you know, it's like a, a sneeze. So taking, okay, so now relating that to what we do. Well, Prometheus. A really big tangent. <laughs> yeah, that's how I, that's how I work. So 
Prometheus basically stood for his, stood for his principles, brought the fire, the, the wisdom, the knowledge, technology down to mankind and away from the gods, the elites. And our charity has a similar purpose. We are going to bring philosophy from the, the inaccessible, the illegible realm that it exists in now and make it accessible to all. And also show people that it can be rational, it can make sense, and it, it can be for freedom, for living a good life, for living for your own sake. So we're going to set up clubs across campuses in the UK. I said there's six, and that's, that's for now. So just give me time. <laughs> I, I, I love and admire his, his confidence in this. See, this is something we don't see where I come from. So cheers to you. I mean, I've been drinking all the time, but cheers to you. Yeah, I'm not a big drinker, but this is damn good. Yes, <laughs> yes, I brought the good wine and I can. <laughs> I'm happy about this. Well, we were, we were discussing like philosophy, I don't know, for 20, 30, 40 minutes at this point. So my big question is, um, are there some superheroes that embody the values that we sort of discussed uh, throughout this day? Superheroes? And I mean, superheroes, I mean, superheroes in the real world. I don't know, uh, people that everybody right. knows. You can think of, I don't know, yeah. uh, Elon Musk. You can think of, uh, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, right. anyone. I am one of the worst people to ask this question to because, like I said, I don't follow pop culture. I hardly watch any movies and when I do, they're not usually movies from today. I don't watch TV, I don't have Twitter, I don't really read the news. So I, I hope that they're out there, but I simply don't know about them. There are some people who have some traits that I admire, but I don't know about superheroes in real life. But you know what I would tell you? I don't think it has, I think people need role models. You need to know what, what it We're looks using like. role models. Much proper, proper way of phrasing it than superheroes. Yeah, I prefer I, that I, too. I liked Marvel, so. I do like the, the, the heroic idea, but if we're talking about, and I think that the difference is that the heroic idea is for yourself. You want to be a hero, but the role model is how you see others or, if, if, or how you are to others. And I think when I say we need, we need to be heroic and we need to find role models, I mean, the, the, this is not an, an, an essential thing, but it certainly helps. But I don't think that you necessarily need to find it in the real world. And I think that's what good literature and good art is for. And even good, like good movies and good TV shows like that embody the hero. And when, when you see, or, or even heroic action, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the ideal man or woman. It can be a heroic action. In fact, it can even be the opposite of a heroic action and the ideal man and woman. It can be like the, the, the villain, the, the, the embodiment of evil and bad. And you, you, you watch this and you're like, I don't, I don't want to be any of this. So like, I really like Dostoevsky and I find loads of his characters are uh, the exact opposite of who I want to be. And I, so I, I think it is important to have role models. It is important to aspire to be a hero to, to live a heroic life like otherwise what are you you're living an amateur life and, and what's what's the point what you, like what are you aspiring to be and, and this doesn't mean that you have to be popular and famous and whatever but the point is that even if you're just a well I say just but even if you're a coffee shop owner well why not be the best coffee shop owner in your neighborhood why not be the serve the best coffee in your country why not open another branch like think big and again it, it, this, you don't have to and there, there's no duty to like be a, a business magnet or to serve the best coffee but find something that you're passionate about and pursue it and I think that once you find that thing and you pursue it you'll find that you want to be the hero and when you want to be the hero you will eventually also become a role model and you know what I was walking today in in the streets of Skopje and I see a, a massive statue of Alexander the Great. And I, I love Alexander. And I thought to myself, this, this guy, by, by my age, had conquered like half of the known world. Him and his friends, him and, him and his, his uh, fellow fighters, all, all of, the, of the same relative age. 
Look at 25 year olds today or 24 year olds or, who are, or 20 year olds, generally speaking, they, they cry and complain that they have to get up and go to work and be productive in order to earn money. Like just compare the two and I think it's very clear the, the state of our culture and the moral bankruptcy that we live in today. So I think there's, there's going back to your original question of the, the super, uh, superheroes, the role models, just heroic action. Yeah, you need to find some, some figure that embodies it, whether it's in real life or in fiction or in art or wherever it may be. But you should aspire to live your best life. You should aspire to be the hero and not to be an extra in someone else's movie. And that, and, and you know what? So one of the things that I, one of the things that I find when I talk to some people in my circles, and these circles are mostly philosophical circles, then, or people dealing with philosophy, is that they're entirely focused on the mind. And it kind of makes sense because we're dealing with ideas, but you can't forget about the, the body. At the end of the day, you're not just a floating consciousness. Like you, you're, the mind and the body are an integrated unit and you can't neglect one or the other. So the, the, the state of the culture today, you see people neglecting both, either or, but it's very difficult to find someone and, and you, you want to find people, if, you, if you're looking for role models, who are consistent and maintain a healthy, healthy mind and a healthy physical appearance. And this has to do with hygiene, this has to do with exercise, with diet, with sleep, with everything that pertains to your lifestyle. So if you want to li live a heroic life, if you want to embody the hero, get up and do something about it. It's not just going to happen. I, I think you kind of did with a cheap shot here with Alexander and, and the modern modern youngsters. But uh, before I, I get to what I think you did a cheap shot with, let me just sort of explain. So usually in Macedonia, we have uh, our restaurants called Kafanas. And usually what you would do when you get like this stuffed um, uh, pork sirloin, you would just cut it in a lot of um, uh, medium pieces and then you would put it on a, like a, uh, like a uh, platter or meat platter. So it would look something like this and everybody or everybody gets a piece and all or you just you just uh, serve it uh, serve it in a very plain thing like this again this comes uh, 9 out of 10, ten times with uh, potatoes but because my guest wants to get pumped in the you know for the for the summer body beach body and of course Let's be honest, it's my guest <laughs> who wants to get pumped. We chose to not insult the Macedonian culture in a sense and, and put some veggies on the side. So we just said there will be no size. Uh, and before I continue for, for sort of, we're just gonna have ice cream with some, uh, some um, uh, regular um, berries and uh, strawberries and I don't know, blueberries and raspberries. Uh, on the side after after the the meat of course so uh, yeah with that I'm gonna do the very basic uh, lazy Balkan thing I'm just gonna flip it and of course it's a clean plate and um, yeah with with this uh, sort of uh, we come to the uh, pinnacle the last question of of uh, of the episode but again I I, I I I promised you the cheap shot thing you mentioned Alexander and Alexander is like you know, uh, from the Gaussian curve, he is like five, six times from the from the uh, standard deviation uh, from the middle, and you are comparing it to the middle. I don't know, uh, complacency of today. So I I kind of think that that was a cheap shot in that sense, but I will agree with the quote unquote generosity of the today. So Would you agree with this? I I do agree. I don't think it was a cheap shot, and I and and I don't think that the. The, what I was trying to represent isn't that everybody has to be an Alexander the Great, but everyone should aspire for greatness. That, that is what I think. I, I, don't, I don't see the point of living an amateur life. And not everybody is going to be an Alexander the Great. And also by Alexander the Great, well, what do we mean? Like you can be an Alexander the Great, again, as I mentioned, in a, a, working in a coffee shop. You can be Alexander the Great 
uh, working in a dojo. You can be Alexander the Great doing anything, but you should strive to live the professional life. You should strive to do things as best as you can. And you should, yes, try, strive to live the best life that you can. And also one thing other be uh, people say is, oh, Alexander the Great, you're talking thousands of years ago. This has nothing to do with, with today. The world has changed so much. Well, in a sense it has. It, it, it's a completely different world in many ways, but it's also a very similar world in some. And what I say is, well, if you can read books and learn history and understand the lessons and extract the parallels to modern times from them, then you have a huge advantage on everyone else and you're miles ahead. But it's not about having an advantage of everyone else. It's about living a good life. And you, you basically have the key to, to living a good life. And there's, there's a great quote that isn't exact again, but it, it summarizes pretty much what, what I mean, which is every challenge you face today was faced by someone a thousand years ago who wrote a book about it. <laughs> so just keep reading and you're going to find the answers. So yeah, it was a cheap shot in a sense, but if you understand exactly what I mean, then I think it makes complete sense. See, explaining it like this for the regular people, the economists like me, I would agree with you. And I still think it was a cheap shot, but explained it this way is far more, um, on point and I, I would yeah. agree with you in a sense you have to live the best life uh, that you have uh, that, that you can have for yourself first and foremost and everybody else uh, afterwards but uh, yeah and uh, with this we sort of came to the last uh, part of the episode the most important for me personally and this is like how do we find freedom in an unfree world and I love this question so I really want to hear your thoughts and believe me I only told him that we are gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna ask this, but I did not want the answer beforehand, so I, I want to be impressed by the philosopher here. <laughs> so, you know, before I answer that question, I just want to point out, because I realized my dad is just gonna ask me, oh, you ate ice cream, Eli? You don't eat ice cream. I'm not eating this ice cream, it's, it's for display. <laughs> anyway, so... He really wants to get buffed, he's only gonna eat fruits. Yeah, that's also not what it's about, but <laughs> we'll take that out. Uh, no. So how do you find freedom in an unfree world? That was your question? How do you yes. find freedom in an unfree yes. world? I don't think you do. I don't think you can find freedom in an unfree world. Like, if you think about it, well, if freedom is a political concept, so freedom is, is a political system, a system of governance, which I think is what we're talking about, and the world is unfree, then how could you find it? Like, I'm looking around, but the world is unfree, so I don't find this thing. So I don't think you do find freedom in an unfree world. I think you create it. And I think that that's what we ought to, to strive for. That's what we ought to teach. That's what my charity is about. That's what I'd like to do with my life. I'd like to create freedom. And I think that the way to go about it is, is, is education. As, as the entire episode have been hammering back and forth, I think that you create freedom and that's what we're going to do with my charity. And I think the way to do so, there's nothing more dangerous in a sense than a well-structured argument. And I used to think that was the economic case for freedom. And I now realize that there's nothing more powerful than the moral, the philosophical case for freedom. And I truly believe, I know that every individual can exist for their own sake. They have the right to do so. You don't have to serve others, you don't have to sacrifice yourself, and you don't have to sacrifice others. In fact, it's, some might say it's beautiful just to be independent. See, we started with a cheer to freedom. I would love to end with a cheer to freedom. Let's cheer to independence. Okay, we changed this. Uh, Cheer to independence and yes, uh, again, thank you for joining me. This was the, the, the last part of the episode. So um, I, I really did, as you can see with the smile on my face, I really did enjoy our conversation. Um, I hope that the food you will like and you are not allowed to say otherwise. <laughs> but yes, with this, we end our latest episode of uh, Cook and Liberty. Thanks for joining and as always, stay free.